So to get back to the Ansel Keys model of coronary atherosclerosis, in, in simple terms, it is you eat all the saturated fat. Point one is it raises your blood cholesterol concentration. <coughs> point two, that clogs your arteries. And point three, the clogged artery then causes myocardial ischemia. Now recall that this model was developed on only stage four because they believed they had proved that countries, people are living in countries that have lots of fat, develop myocardial ischemia and coronary thrombosis and so on. And people didn't bother to go through the, pre, the other steps, the points one, point two, point three. And if you develop a model, it's your responsibility to test all three areas. Because what has happened today is that now everyone knows that cholesterol causes heart disease, and that's the model. So if we raise cholesterol, you're going to die of heart attack. If we drop it, you're not going to die of heart attack. But that's, that's if the model is true. If the model's not true, it doesn't work that way. And I'm going to show you this model has never, ever been proven. These four steps have not been proven. So, Professor, just for uh, clarification purposes, myocardial ischemia, coronary thrombosis, acute myocardial infarction, ventricular arrhythmias, and, and uh, well, those four would be heart diseases. That's correct, and those occur when, if we looked at this clogged artery, which is meant to look yellow because that's meant to be all cholesterol, but of course it's not that simple, it's not all cholesterol. This clogged artery must then rupture, because I'll show you that a clogged artery doesn't cause those things. It's a ruptured artery that causes those problems. And the rupture is when the plaque ruptures, so that's another part of the component. Professor, maybe you can just explain what a plaque is. The plaque is the area in yellow that is shown. So the normal artery, if we, if we look, might be up here. You can see that's the normal artery. And then there's this ingress of material. And it's shown here as yellow. And that's kind of suggesting it's all made of fat, but it's, not, it's much more complex than that. And we've got another video to show that because there are other cells and there, there are muscle cells and there are inflammatory cells and there are all sorts of other cells involved. But that is what we would call, would call the plaque. Now it's my contention that the plaque is not the issue, it's when the plaque ruptures that these develop. Because if the plaque ruptures, it obstructs the blood flow and now no blood can get to the part of the heart muscle beyond the artery in this area and that then can cause reduced blood supply, that's ischemia. That's a coronary thrombosis, is the obstruction. Acute myocardial infarction refers to the death of heart muscle in the area provided, supplied by that blood vessel. Or the heart may go into what we call arrhythmia, where it stops contracting properly and it just fibrillates. And that's called ventricular arrhythmia, which is also a consequence of plaque rupture and, and ischemia to the heart muscle. And the ventricular arrhythmia, because the heart's not pumping blood, will cause sudden death because you, you've got no blood pressure, no blood can flow to the brain. Thank you, Professor. Please carry on. So, so that's the theory. And this is what, what most students are taught. The more LDL there is in the blood, the more rapidly atherosclerosis develops. And this is a statement by two Nobel Prize winners, Michael Brown and Joseph Goldstein. So if they've said it and they won the Nobel Prize, who's, who, who's anyone to question it? And I'll show you that that has never been, never been proven, and I'll give you the evidence for that. So that is a statement that is convenient, it fits the model, but it's model dependent. And if LDL isn't actually causing arterial disease, then that statement is wrong. Now, one of the first big studies, associational studies, was the Framingham study, in which a population in Framingham, which is a small town outside Boston, 5,000 men and women were studied prospectively to see what factors in their health could predict whether or not they had heart attacks. And one of the factors was cholesterol in the blood and their blood pressure and a few other variables. And if you ask a medical student, they'll say, well, it was the Framingham study which proves that cholesterol causes heart disease because the higher the cholesterol was in the Framingham population, the quicker they died from heart disease. So let's see what the, what the leader of the Framingham study said 30 years after, and this is William Castelli, and he writes this 30 years later. 
Most of what we know about the effects of diet factors, particularly the saturation of fat and cholesterol and blood lipids parameters, derives from ward-type studies. Also, such findings within a cohort studied over time have been disappointing. Indeed, the findings have been contradictory. For example, in, in Framingham, Massachusetts, the more saturated fat one ate, the more cholesterol one ate, the more calories one ate, the lower the person's serum cholesterol. The exact opposite, the diet heart hypothesis. And this is from the man who was involved in the Framingham study, which medical students will tell you co proved cholesterol causes heart disease. And that was the opposite. In these people free living, it was the opposite of what one saw in 26 metabolic ward studies. So here are some data from Framingham, 1979. And this is the real data for the cholesterol measured in that group in the Framingham study who did not develop heart disease over a 30-year period. Now, if cholesterol is the single cause of heart disease, all those without heart disease, that's what they will look. They'll, look in a, they'll be in a curve to the right with essentially no overlap. So this area of overlap in the middle here will be very small. And that would mean if you've had a cholesterol of 381, you know you were at high risk of heart attack. Whereas if you had a value of 260 or something, you knew you were not going to have a heart attack. Now, that's what happens if you've got diabetes. The graph on the left might be blood glucose levels in people with normals, and on the right would be with diabetes. And there's no very little overlap. So we would know, we'd be able to say, yes, you've got diabetes or you haven't. Now, let's look at the actual distribution curves of these two populations. That's it. There is a major overlap. And so that it is very difficult to decide if you're sitting in this area here, which is the majority of people, whether or not you can ever have a heart attack based on the simple measurement of your, to your cholesterol, total cholesterol. And these people realized that in the long term that cholesterol was an almost useless parameter to predict heart attack risk in the Framingham study. And this is what they wrote. Again, Castelli wrote this in 1996. 90% of the total cholesterol levels measured were useless by themselves predicting the risk of heart disease in the general population. You, you read that. He said it was useless. And this is the man who built his life around the Framingham study. Indeed, twice as many individuals had a lifetime total cholesterol of less than 200 milligrams per deciliter. And that's the level at which we start to treat in South Africa, had heart disease. So in other words, twice as many people had low cholesterol, had heart disease compared to those who had higher cholesterols. And that, of course, is a distribution effect because there are very few people at the high level, but there are many people in the small level. So you have to ask yourself, well, if this is true, how can cholesterol be the primary driver of heart disease? And then there were more data. Here's another. This was the next argument. So now this is 30 years follow-up of the Framingham study. After age 50, there is no increased overall mortality with either high or low serum cholesterol levels. And in fact, at, at my advanced age, and I haven't got, won't show you data, the higher your cholesterol is, the longer you live. So you've got this paradox that suddenly when you turn 60 or 65, having a high cholesterol is good. So, but falling blood cholesterol levels after age 51 were associated with increase in overall mortality and increased death rate from heart attacks. So that there's a direct association between what? Between falling cholesterol levels over the first 14 years of the Framing study and mortality over the following 18 years. And that is the finding across the board, that there is, as you get older, higher cholesterols mean lower risk of heart disease, lower risk of cancer, and increased longevity. And, it's, it's, and we can't hide it because those are the facts. So, so and, and I'll just show you one other variable because now I'm going to bring into another variable and I'll show you that this is a, this is a complex slide in which we look at the effects of two variables on risk of heart disease, which is the, the height of the column tells us the rates of heart disease per four years in people based on two measurements. And the one measurement is your total blood cholesterol concentration, and the other is the HDL cholesterol, which many of you will know is called the good cholesterol, and that's a terrible term because it's cholesterol. How can you have good and bad cholesterol? Cholesterol is cholesterol can't be good and bad, it's either, it's either, no, it's neutral. So, what this shows that if you have an increasing total cholesterol, 
but you have a high HDL cholesterol, your risk at this level of cholesterol, in other words, quite a high value, this might be six or seven units, your risk is not changed. So when we look at cholesterol plus this other variable, as long as you have a high HDL cholesterol, it doesn't matter what your total cholesterol is, you're fine. But on the other hand, if you've got a low HDL cholesterol, even with a normal cholesterol, what, what we would say is normal, you've got a very high risk. And even increasing your total cholesterol makes no difference. You're still at such high risk. And what I'm going to argue is that HDL cholesterol is a measure of insulin resistance. So that the more insulin resistant you are, the lower your cholesterol. So this would fit nicely with the model which says that it's actually insulin resistance which is the marker of risk of heart attack, not total cholesterol. So what I've done for you here is to give you the evidence from the people who believe the model and show you that it doesn't fit. The findings they have don't fit the model. So let's go back now. This was a large study of 136,000 people hospitalized in Los Angeles for heart attacks. And the finding, now this value, this cholesterol value of 130 is way below any value that a doctor in Cape Town would, would start treating you. But yet 72% of all heart attacks occurred in that group, which you would never receive treatment for in Cape Town. Because the doctors would say, but there's no way you can have a heart attack at such a low cholesterol value. And here's the distribution of the values. And so these, these are values of five, which is where most people get concerned. If you go to your doctor today, they'd say five is the value. Well, that's, that's the value of about 200. So look at it, the distribution. These are people who had heart attacks. Here's a Japanese uh, sample, and you'll see that they have slightly higher cholesterol values and their risks of heart attack are much lower. And now I'm going to just take you a step further into the hypothesis. So now there's the population with the LDL cholesterol levels. And notice that most of them are below 5, and most of them have normal values despite having heart attacks. But remember we mentioned HDL cholesterol. So 72% had a normal cholesterol, and they shouldn't have, been, shouldn't have had heart attacks. Here's the HDL cholesterol values. And remember we said high values are good and low values are bad. And it turns out that 55% of the population have bad values or low values and low 40. And therefore, we would say that these people are at increased risk. So the HDL gives us a much better measure. But the value that you really want to look is triglycerides. And look, and normally we would say that if these are the normal values of triglycerides would be up to here. So 4% of this population had normal triglyceride levels. So if you were looking at this population, you wanted to know what's going to predict heart attack risk, it's the triglycerides. And what I'm going to show you at great length is that the triglycerides are a measure of insulin resistance. So again, we have two measures here of insulin resistance that are predicting heart attack risk. And finally, if you look, I've written high carbohydrates and high fat diets. And I'll show you this evidence repeatedly that high fat diets produce low triglycerides and high HDL cholesterol, what you want to have. Whereas high carbohydrate diets cause low HDL cholesterol and high triglycerides, the opposite of what you want. So if I was to make a diagnosis on this population, I would say the majority of this population is eating a high carbohydrate diet. And there are very few who might be eating a high fat diet. But what would they have been told? They would have been told that you had your heart attack because you're eating a high fat diet.